if there's big problems on something, I have to own that. But if there's if there's big successes, I have to give that information away. I, I'm strong enough in my own personal character to be able to, to do that. And I get rewarded in other ways. Business of Architecture, episode 190. Hello, I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the podcast for architects, where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. I'd like to invite you to discover how to double your architecture firm income and create your dream practice of freedom and impact by downloading my free four-part architecture firm profit map. As a podcast listener, you can get instant access by going to freearchitectgift.com. Joining us today is the co-managing principal of Gensler's Southeast Region, Kenneth P. Baker. In addition to managing the Southeast Region and being on the Gensler Management Committee, Ken Baker is considered a global expert in workplace design and planning, having designed more than 10 million square feet, that's a lot, of corporate headquarters and offices for law firms and financial institutions around the world. Now, here's the thing. If if Gensler's Southeast Region, which Ken Baker is the co-manager of, if it were ranked separately from Gensler in terms of size, it would be one of the 10 largest firms in the U.S., perhaps in the world, to give just to give you a sense of the size and responsibility of this position. This is a fantastic episode. Today's episode, you'll hear about the challenges and opportunities of moving from a design role into a management role, how those skill sets are complementary and sometimes pose their own challenges. You'll discover what you can do to grow within an organization and externally with your clients. And Ken's going to share with us the secret success for building his secret sauce for building successful long-term relationships while at the same time delivering great value to clients. So without further ado, let's get down to business. All right. Well, Ken Baker, welcome to the business of architecture. Thank you. Uh, Would you start out telling our audience what goes into your role as the co-managing principal of Gensler's Southeast Region? Wow, that's a that's a that's a great starting question. That's a big question. Um, let's see. I'll start very simply. We have um, like um, uh, nine regions in the firm. Southeast region is one of the larger regions. We have um, um, eight offices in our region: from uh, Philly, Baltimore, D.C., Atlanta, Raleigh, Charlotte. Miami. So my role as co-regional managing principal is to make sure that we are um, we are building the business across those regions. We're building those offices. We're building people's careers in those offices. And as we say at Gensler, it all starts and ends with our clients, making sure that our clients are happy and the services that we're providing are helping our clients grow and become more successful at the same time. And in terms of your day to day, tell me about what you're focused on. I, I know you do management, obviously, and you also do some design work. Give me a picture yeah. of what is the daily, you know, a typical day in the life of Ken Baker. Uh, so, because we have eight offices, um, the biggest being DC, on the on the my daily kind of travels on the regional managing principal role are, I have a weekly uh, chat with the office leaders of each individual office where I have our CFO, regional CFO, and each of the office leaders in succession uh, some because we have eight and there's only five days in the business week. We there's a couple of days have have two offices that report in. We do an hour long download on what the financial metrics are for that office, what the business development efforts are for that office, what the business wins are for that office, um, new staff hiring, how we're mentoring people, uh, IT programs that we want to put out there, kind of a state of the art health check on a weekly basis with each of the people that are running those businesses. And um, that's, so that's on the regional managing principal side. That's a, that's a big deal. I sit in D.C., so I, although we have two office leaders for the D.C. office, I get involved in quite a few of the D.C. things because I'm here. It's the biggest office. We have, you know, 400-some people in this office. I get um, pulled into a lot of the day-to-day business with D.C., which is great. So that's kind of the admin thing. Then I have some responsibilities. I'm on the board of directors starting in January for the firm, on the management committee for the firm. So there's uh, there's no merit badges given here. Every time a title or a, or a, 
or a, or a new initiative is put on, you have to produce. You have to bring impact to that. So that's all kind of that admin management kind of thing. I also locally, I'm, I oversee uh, design. I was came into the business wanting to be a designer. Um, I trained as an architect on shell and core buildings. Quickly moved into a role of 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 um, moved into interiors versus shell and core architecture, and that's a story in itself. But um, so I st- in that pie. I have a major law firm that I that I as as Gensler would call the account leader. Um, we do all of their offices globally. They've got like 17 locations, and I've been working with them now for 20 years. It's really the only client that I kind of focus on now. I dabble in a bunch of other clients to a lesser degree, but this is a full-on focus. And on that, that's that occupies the other part of my time. But I have teams across the globe. Like I have a team in San Francisco. I have a team in Chicago. Well, I was there the other day with this particular client. I've team in Europe, a team in Asia, et cetera, et cetera. So as I get older, um, I have to travel less because I've got great people that are helping build that business and take care of that client in those other locations. So that fills my time. <laughs> and with all the spare time, what do you do? Well, I've got, I've got a lot of outside interests. I, uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a designer, so I'm constantly reinventing the way my house looks, and I'm an avid collector of art and antiques and things like that. I design very contemporary things, but I live in a um, Victorian Albert Museum, um, as as my friends say. It's like the Baker Museum, um, so it's very eclectic, but it's very based in antiques. So I spend a lot of time collecting antiques, artwork, etc. I um, am also into music. Um, I trained in music and piano and uh, that that whole part of my career was I used to do a lot of theater and I'd like to think the theater things helped me ready myself for the client contact that I have, the presentation work that I do with clients and, and elsewhere. So all of those hobbies have kind of worked together uh, to supplement what I what I bring to our client offering and in, in the way of giving my career and my experience to their uh, work. How was it to make the transition coming into the industry as a designer originally? You, you said that that was sort of your origin and then moving into a management responsibility. Talk to me about uh, some of the challenges or maybe some of the uh, benefits you had from your skill set in that transition. I, you know, it, it was not necessarily the most common path to be um, a designer focused on doing innovative, you know, award-winning, excellent design work to go into, um, you know, here at Gensler or other firms, a studio leadership position, which is our building blocks, you know, individual businesses within the office, studio director position, then going to an office director, then going to a regional director. But it's something that I always wanted to do. I'm a people person. Uh, uh, one of the biggest things that you bring to uh, the table as a office leader or a regional leader is your focus on not only building the business, but your focus on building the people in our business and um, advancing their careers and, in a sense, building them so they can replace you or or go offshoot and build another you know office to add to the eight offices that we've got here or the 40-some offices that we have it wasn't a it wasn't a direct path, but it uh, that's chosen by many. Usually, as a designer, you just become a design director and you keep uh, leading design on major projects and and innovating design and taking the firm to the next level. But I had said uh, back when I joined Gensler, I wanted to, I saw what my mentor and my boss was doing, Diane Hoskins, who's now the CEO, and I said every year at my review, my uh, we call them PDPs. Um, We would talk about goals and objectives, and I said I wanted to be sitting in the chair you're sitting because I really – it's a role that I really um, um, aspire towards. And then it became the regional role after that. There's always, you know, a constant movement. There's no glass ceiling. There's a a way to move from what you think is the top to yet another plateau. What what do you think it is in your life that prompted you to uh, tell – you know, your superior at that time, Diane Hoskins, that you wanted to sit in her seat. What was, what's been driving you? What is it that drives you? I, 
look, it was probably um, – it was the fact that you were able to – that a person in that role was able to um, affect so many situations, affect client situations – a sense to by designing by being leading a firm or an office that's doing great design work you're helping build the community um that's kind of on the client and the project thing on the people side of things it's like you you recognize people that are really really talented that are coming out of school and i've been a person that has wanted to give back some of the honors and awards and positions i've been given by somebody above me that who's recognized talent and ability, um, maybe misplaced at times, but I've always felt that it, I get a big reward out of seeing young people grow into other um, levels or older people growing into much bigger levels as well. So there's the people thing. And then there's also, you know, just the, I'm a people person. I said, it's like developing, you know, there's a thrill of developing the business and see it happen very successfully. And, and, you know, the best thing are, is to have um, a thank you for the support that they've been giving on promotions day, which we have coming up um, on the 16th of December, our annual promotions day, or on the client side, having a client write a testimonial on, on, asked for, um, sent to the firm, the CEOs of the firm saying that that m my team really performed and took them to a different level. So as an office leader, a regional leader, you're kind of building all of those things together. Sorry for the long-winded filibuster answer on that one. That's fantastic. Uh, something that's coming up again and again in your answers here is the desire to build other people, the, the idea of relationships and building those relationships. I'd like to know, how do you maintain those relationships? Oftentimes, I know we all struggle with the big Rolodex of people keeping in contact with yeah. people. T tell me how you maintain relationships in the long term. <clears throat> well, in-house, in Gensler, you have to maintain those relationships. It's not a Rolodex relationship. It is a you know, you have got to touch base. You've these office uh, once a week. I have to be seen to be in the in the seat, helping them solve problems, mentoring them, helping them solve problems. For the big um, contact list that I have outside of the firm, to you know, Gensler being a global leader in design, and and you have to maintain connection. You have to be, in effect, the face of Gensler in this role out to the community and that involves being you know participating in things at the board of trade things at the chamber of commerce client related events that you you know you, you, you kind of do that circuit of of events but it's it's all with the idea that you're you're not only meeting a group but you're actually building relationships with folks and you're continually reminding them hey we're here we want to, you know, we can help solve your problems. We can, you know, it's not just, you know, uh, calling up a client um, out of the Rolodex to say, what have you got for me today? We need some new project work. What have you got for me today? That's kind of a commoditized situation. It's calling that same client and saying, we just did research on um, some, you know, some topic. I, I think it would really help your business. Send this information over. It might just help you. And then hopefully they'll be thinking of us the next time a project comes up and said, hey, those folks really know what they're doing and they helped me out in this thing and gave me something I really needed. What's your systematic process for keeping in touch with people so they don't fall through the cracks? Is it, do you have a, a process for that? Um, uh, well, first of all, like with my major client, which is a law firm, Sidley Austin, based in Chicago, and I have to meet with all the office leaders of that firm, and even though I, I were kind of hired through a central source in the Chicago headquarters, I have to be seen as an advocate and an advocate for all of those individual office leaders when they need something to improve their office or make their business operations better. So there is a circuit that I kind of go through globally of talking, you know, making sure that I have time to put in a phone call, not just send an email. I think email emails are okay to a point, and they certain certainly help when you've got time frame uh, time um, differences on the globe. But picking up the phone and talking to somebody is really valuable. And I tell our folks that all the time: don't write me a long email explaining something. Pick up the phone or leave me a voicemail, and let's move it on to 
you know, if we need to schedule a time to talk, that's fine. But all of those office leaders and, and my other contacts in the community, I think will understand that if I've if I've made the time to pick up the phone in my busy schedule, that it really means something to me um, about what they're thinking or what their needs are. Do you have a tool to keep track of when you last contacted someone just to make sure that no one flips slips through the cracks? Uh, you know what, uh, Enoch, I would like to tell an untruth and say that I do, but I don't. It's kind of a gut feel. Um, I have a big sense of urgency and I'll wake up and I get up really early in the morning and I power walk and I've got this kind of route that I do. I did that when I lived in London. I did that here before I moved to London. I do it here now. And that gives me time every morning with headphones on, listening to NPR or whatever I've got going on to kind of put my game plan together of the people I need to touch base with. And I, I make a mental note of it. I come back and I write it down. Then I shower and dress and everything. And I come into the office and I've got my little list. And, you know, hopefully, yeah, sometimes things do fall through the cracks and I'm like, oops, but, um, you know, sense of urgency. It's really good. If, if somebody's depending on you to get back to them, problem, but own up to it and apologize and move on and get the work done. If, if it's just me doing a network thing, you know, do it. It can do it. You got to do it. So I, I don't have a system. I, it's kind of more of something that's up here in my head. What would you say are the keys to growing internally, growing the staff that you work with and helping them grow into those positions? You talked about that several times earlier about, you know, Gensler has this, uh, this, this, uh, I guess this policy or this way of operating where, you know, it seems like you've grown because you give people opportunities in new offices. So what, what is your personal yeah. kind of viewpoint on growing people and helping them move up? Uh, trusting them that you are allowing them to take risks without fear of repercussion. You know, there are going to be, you know, challenges and there's going to be setbacks and there's going to be bumps in the road, but you have to give folks a runway. You have to the pool sometimes and it's not always going to be successful, but are they, are they growing from, um, you know, the mistakes they make and the, and the issues that get created? Are they growing? Are they learning from those things? So I think that's the big thing. Um, pushing people forward in a way that, you know, and uh, another big important thing is giving them credit for the work that they're doing. I mean, it's really easy for us that are running offices or studios or whatever to say, yeah, my project won the design award for so-and-so. Well, I may be the client relationship leader for Sidley, but when a Sidley project wins a design award or a client sends a testimonial, one of the Sidley directors said, you know, this team did a great, I give that information right back. To, I, I'm giving credit to where credit is due. And I've, I've gotten a lot of awards and accolades in my career. And I was closest to the people that gave, passed on that recognition and didn't take it on their themselves. And when people haven't done that, I've always said to myself, I don't want to be like that because if so, I'd like to always be, give that, to, give that information away to other people. I, I look at it this way, Enoch, if there's big problems on something, I have to own that. But if there's, if there's big successes, I have to give that information away. I, I'm strong enough in my own personal character to be able to to do that, and you know, I get rewarded in other ways. <laughs> Which are seeing those people grow. When I moved to London, just a side story. When I was asked to leave my position as office leader of the DC office in 2007 and move to London and oversee, co-manage the region, the the London, European, and Gulf regions for Gensler. I um, had been mentoring a colleague of mine all along, and one of the biggest, uh, proudest moments of my career is upon my exiting DC, this individual, he, he was put in my position. So, you know, just I was as thrilled as he was about his promotion into that position because it was like, oh my God, this is, this is great. He's going to take over, you know, right in my footsteps. And that individual happens to be, uh, I came back when I was asked to come back and now I've just been made my co-managing principal for the region. So we have had a partnership that's extended for almost 20 years and it's been very, uh, very intertwined. Tell me about the transition going from leading the, the DC office, I think you said it was, and then going to Europe. What were some of the challenges that you had 
getting and making that transition to going overseas to London and what are you know what 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 was involved in that well when I left DC I was running the DC office and and Diane Hoskins was this the region was the regional managing principal at the time we had we didn't have the Florida office we were just starting to to develop the Tampa office we had at um, and Charlotte and um, Baltimore. We didn't have Philly, so I was in a region that didn't have the, the the breadth that it has today. When I moved to London, I was not only a office, the big regional office, and then we had uh, two or three offices in the Middle East. So, and then there was a Gulf in between, but. Although we didn't have offices on the continent in between the Middle East and London, I was responsible for London and which you know and Ireland, and I was responsible for developing business in France and Italy and Germany and you name it, um, you know, and also in Russia and also the Middle East and also the Middle East. So when I moved into that position, I had culturally a much bigger set of issues and and challenges to deal with how to do business in all of those there was different approaches even from i had worked a lot in london and i had worked in some other uh european countries out of dc which i think helped prep me for that but it's never really the same until you get on the ground and you're actually living in the other country and you have to recognize you know um you got to have people nationals supporting you i did you know i was this american guy coming in to run the office in london but my british partners in that office my colleagues had to have a major role it wasn't just about me you know being the lead guy in in these scenarios you you know there's there's a great sensitivity towards local national you know culturally ingrained people to be leading projects in their country and we've got to support that and use that to build the business um you know, and that so and there was a different set of circumstances with every one of those countries that we did work in and continue to. Why do you think it was that you specifically were moved into that role over there? Uh, well, um, well, I was going back and forth to London a lot. It was obvious to the firm, to Gensler, to Arthur Gensler at the time that I was very, very comfortable in the UK and the London uh, lifestyle. I was very much of an anglophobe and anglophile and not an anglophobe but anglophile and i was um my literary hero is oscar wilde and i think i um kind of <laughs> grand kingdom you know with a lot of um of 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 good parts of oscar wilde kind of in my brain and i was able to relate to people at a very um fundamental level i wasn't some you know anointed person that was being sent over from the UK, I was very down to earth, sent over from the US, I was very down to earth. I think my firm saw that I played well and, and was able to relate to people and clients very well in, in those um, circumstances. So you played well with them. But what was the actual, what was the key characteristic that you brought to the table that put you in that position? What did that office need that you brought to it? Um, as it would be anywhere, I think there's some commonalities. It's list. And when an office, when a client talks about goals and objectives, you've got to listen. And when your team talks about their career goals and objectives, you've got to listen. I think that's kind of the same here as it is there. But it was particularly important to let people know when I moved over to the UK and was doing work there that I didn't come in with a preconceived agenda of what needed to happen. I was listening to what the goals and objectives were. And acting on them and delivering impact and delivering, you know, it's one thing to listen and then find and go off and do your own thing. But it was actually coming back and reinstating those goals and objectives and say, that's why we want to do this. Is this, does this work? Okay. So it sounds like from what I'm getting from what you're saying, Ken, is that it was your, your ability to listen and then your ability to act on the things that you understood that really brought the value to you being over there in London. Was there anything else in addition to that? Um, you know, I would have, when I was moved over to London, Enoch, it was the, 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 I sold my house here and I moved, you know, my belongings over there. I, 
I got a beautiful place. It was a it was a move that was intended to be for the rest of my career. While I soon found out that there were, you know, so I guess what I'm saying is when I went there, I approached it as this is the next chapter of my life and I'm going to live in the UK or possibly on the continent and till I retire. And, you know, who knows? I could retire in the UK and, you know, I would always be a U.S. citizen, but I'd probably have this dual citizenship. So I, I went in with the mindset that I was a permanent, I was going to be a permanent resident and got culturally enmeshed. And I think I answered the question, but I, I think the point I'm trying to make is that I believed that I was going to be a long term. I wasn't just a visitor to the country. As it turned out, I was asked four years later, there was another challenge that came up back in, in the Southeast region. And I was asked by Diane to, um, and the, the board of directors to come back and co-lead the region with her. So, so I did it back the other way and, you know, came back here and bought a house and moved everything back into it. And, in 2000, end of 2011, and here we are in 2016. And I'm, I don't know if I have any big moves left in me. I'll tell, I'll tell you that it's a, it's a big move in from. I moved from Chicago to DC, then DC to London, and then back from London. I think I'm till I retire and decide to do something after retirement. I think I'm going to be here. But famous last words. This is true. Maybe you'll come join us out here somewhere. Hey, Ken, um, yeah. during your time in, in London, what was what are what are you most proud of about during that time period? It's kind of a weird thing to be proud of, but um, I I joined the London office in December of 2007. The London office was it had a great book business. And then as we know, September of 2008 came along and I was actually in a client meeting. I was doing a big project for J.P. Morgan Chase at Canary Wharf, 5 million square feet, a new, three new buildings. And we were doing the interiors. We were working hand in glove with the building architect. And I was sitting in a meeting and my client got called out of the room and came back in and said, oh my God, Lehman Brothers just went down. And so we were like, oh, great. What is this going to, you know, we saw, everybody saw the writing on the wall, but till things started really happening, it was, you know, we had a little taste in February of 2008 of what was going to occur. Um, work started getting shut off from around the firm. And um, I immediately, as an office, a regional leader with my British co uh, regional leader, we were placed in a scenario where we had to start um, downsizing our business. As uh, most business, our clients were shutting down operations, we were looking at, um, you know, how we maintained our standing, but, you know, we had to scale back our operations as well. And that is not an easy process. It was a, a big learning process to go through that in another country, particularly the UK, uh, the whole thing around redundancies. And I don't want to focus on the negative, but I think the point I'm making is I think I was able to do that with grace and and um, honesty and fairness. And I didn't want to be this American guy that was coming over in that scenario and making uh, British residents um, subjects, you know, um, redundant and eliminating them from the workforce. I, it wasn't about that. And I think, I, I think I brought another level of understanding and empathy towards that very difficult situation that we were, our firm was experiencing around the rural world as everybody was. So that was one thing that I think I, and the other thing was, um, you know, Again, I, I, we're an American company that developed these offices abroad. The other thing I think I was is if we want to, we call ourselves a global company, but I think I was there to reinforce the fact that we are, you could say you're global, but you have to be local first. So I was in London, so I had to embrace local and Europe and the Middle East. And I had to recognize that the folks that were building that business came from many different cultures um, in that London office. It was kind of this melting pot of a lot of different people from different countries, and they were becoming leaders in that. So to be a global, let's talk about what we did in the North, in the Southeast region in the U.S., what we did in San Francisco, or what we did in Chicago. We really have to make sure that Asia and 
Middle East and Africa and Europe and the UK and all of these other areas, Australia, that we're working in now are all discussed at the same level as the work that we do in North America, South America, the same way. And that's what the firm has been instilling in all of its uh, global platform, they call it, the, the group of leaders that are running the regions of Gensler. And I think I was able to um, re- instill that message when I went to uh, when I went to the UK. And that is a wrap. Thank you for listening today. If you're looking for more time, freedom, impact, and income as an architect, get instant access to my free four-part architect profit map by visiting freearchitectgift.com. The sponsor for today's show is Arch Reach, the client relationship management tool built specifically for architects. If you want to systematize your marketing and business development, Arch Reach will help you do it. Visit archreach.com to learn more. expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world.